The following podcast is a presentation of Project Entertainment Network. Welcome to Staring into the Abyss. I'm your host, Richard Gerlach. With me, as always, is Michael Patrick Hicks. Hello. And new to the show, Steve Stred. Hello. And David Sodergren. Hello. A bit more energy than Steve gave there, you notice. <laughs> <laughs> you, got, you got that good old Scottish try. <laughs> I'm angry over what transcribed just before. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. The pleasure's all on this end. Um, today we'll be discussing full spoilers, and we highly recommend you listeners purchasing a copy of The Navajo Nightmare, written by Steve Stred and David Sodergren. It is a fantastic horror western that is so far from what I've read has been the one I seem to enjoy the most. If I could make and, a question there, it's uh, written by David Sutherland and Steve Strayed, not the other way around. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> it does have the paperbacks and Pugs logo on the cover. <laughs> Are we sharing it? We've got the uh, Black Void Press uh, logo on the back, but not on the side. So, you know. It's Perfect. good stuff. It made it on there somewhere. <laughs> exactly. And I will say, I do love the cover. Ah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I've, I've got a tablet for... Uh, where I do sort of sketches of the covers that I generally want to have that I give on to cover artists and things. But I thought I'd actually give it a shot because it was a uh, based on the classic Western comics and things and the, even, you know, the EC comics, things like that, of the 40s and 50s and stuff. Um, I thought I'd give it a shot myself because it, it didn't have to look photorealistic or anything. Uh, I thought it turned out quite well. It seems to have been well-received by people, so that's nice. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I was actually just going to say it reminds me a lot of those old EC horror comic covers. And yours, David, has a nice little Tales from the Crypt kind of vibe to it. Yes, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. When he, when he started showing me some of the sketches of what he was doing, I was blown away. And then to... To see the final um, version of it is just fantastic. Yeah, it's beautiful. It really is. I'm really glad because I'm I'm confident with my writing and things, but with things like art, uh, I, by the time it came to hit publish, I was like, that's cover shit. I hate it. I absolutely hate it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm very pleased to hear that. That's, that's very kind. <laughs> yeah, I, no, I think it captures the aesthetic of the book as a whole very, very well. I agree with that. And we also wanted to do, um, to, uh, you know, to, to differentiate us from the splatter westerns that are coming out from Death's Head Press. Uh, so, you know, I didn't want to look like we're just copying anyone or anything. So we went a, a very different direction with it to separate us a bit. Yes. Yeah, well, um, yeah, it definitely has that separation. Well, before we fully dive into The Navajo Nightmare, uh, we tend to give like to give a weekly recommendation or just suggestions of media that we've watched, consumed, read over the last week. And I actually don't have a lot this week, so this should go pretty smooth. So we're doing MCAS right now at work, and it is killing me, like mentally just making me really fatigued and draining. So I decided to actually go to the movie theaters during the pandemic because I'm fully vaccinated and I figure yeah. why not just go to the movies and enjoy a movie for a change. And I decided to see the new Saw movie with uh, Chris Rock and Samuel L. Jackson. Now careful. I have booked our cinemas reopen on Monday and I have booked my ticket for that. So no spoilers. I will not right? spoil it for you. Don't worry. We don't give, we don't give spoilers in this section anyway. Good, good. Um, I'll say it is. If you enjoy Saw 2, Saw 3 or Saw 4, You'll enjoy this movie. Power um, horror icons Chris Rock and Samuel L. Jackson. 
<laughs> the power icons, Chris Rock and Samuel L. Jackson, are both great. Awesome. Chris Rock is this is like really great in this movie. Then the focus of the movie is more of a mystery noir type story than focusing on the traps and the gore. It's more focusing on the investigation. I hate to ask this, but I have to, knowing especially that David won't be able to get to the cinema until at least Monday. But slight spoiler, and maybe you don't even want to answer this, but does Samuel L. Jackson die mid-important speech? <laughs> um, he does not die mid-important speech. It, okay. is, not, it is not like the... Um, Deep Blue Sea? What was Deep Blue Sea, yeah. No, they, they don't repeat that again. Okay. So there's no sharks um, in this film, no. There's no sharks in this film. That's a disappointment. The only, there's what are all these motherfucking traps. saws doing on this motherfucking plane? <laughs> <laughs> there's also only like four traps. So they like scaled it down a bit. And I will say like just for the sake of this movie, and this isn't really a spoiler because they, I've already kind of made this in the trailers, but this isn't like it's one of Jigsaw's protégés. It's a Jigsaw copycat. So it's pretty much the person is a copycat of Jigsaw who's specifically targeting the police. And Chris Rock is the lead detective on this assignment to try to catch him before more police officers get killed. And the movie just kind of takes off from there. Um, The traps are cool. The gore is pretty cool when there is gore. And overall, it's an entertaining movie. I didn't love it, but I I had a fun time at it. So if you enjoy the Saw movies, you'll you'll enjoy this one. My criticisms are it feels very mid-2000s in the <laughs> filmmaking style. And I feel like that's more of a detriment than a compliment to the movie. And everything's cool. also shot to be like 11. Like everyone's yelling, everyone's intense, it's all tense all the time. And if you it think works. mid-2000s, Richard, do you mean like the soundtrack is like Godsmack and Korn? Yeah, you, you hear Limp Bizkit playing in the background in half of the scenes. Chris Rock is just rolling around. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> no, what I mean is, like, they do weird, like, slow-mo and speed-up techniques. Like, in the other Saw movies, when it reveals the person's inside a trap, and they have those camera fast-forward panning shots, like, they do that. They do those a lot. See, I hate that in all films apart from Saw, because it's just so <laughs> powerful. So that if it didn't have that in this one, I'd be really disappointed. I want it to look mid 2000s. I want it to have a sort of greenish hue across the screen, you know, to to speed up and slow down. I, 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 that is, yeah. Yeah, it's gonna. It has all that. It, it all feels right. just like a Saw movie. So I think you'll you'll enjoy it in that sense. It's a fun time. There's some good. There's some good humor in it to break away from the tension. And yeah, it's it's really really solid. But I won't get into any spoilers, so you can enjoy the movie as it is as well, David. Uh, that's excellent. No, I'm, I'm very excited about cinemas, cinemas uh, reopening here. So i to that for Monday, and then they're showing Total Recall in a 4K restoration on Wednesday, so I'm going to that as well. Ooh. Oh, nice. They're showing Army of the Dead in theaters here before it goes on Netflix next week, and the only theater near me playing it is in Salem, New Hampshire, and I'm like, yeah, no, that's going to happen. <laughs> Is that far away? That's like an hour and a half drive. Oh, okay, it's a bit far to go see a Zack Snyder movie, so yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'd give Zack Snyder 30 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> no, more, no more than 30 minutes. I feel like traveling to the theater, not from your the comfort of your couch, is a little far for the Zack Snyder. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I feel the spectacle will be cool on the big, on the big theater screen, but that's just, that's just me. But uh, Mike, what about you? Uh, not a whole lot happening on my end. I did, however, start reading, and I'm almost finished with S.A. Cosby's upcoming Razorblade Tears, which releases in July. And this is just a really great classic revenge noir that has been really updated for our current times. It involves two ex-cons who have kind of escaped the life and have kind of gotten themselves to a certain degree, one way or another, back on track. But unfortunately, their sons are married to each other and end up, when the story opens, it's just after their children have been killed and they want to find out what happened and why their children were murdered. Ike is now a 
landscaper out of the joint. He's become a landscaper and started his own business, and his son was a journalist. So right away, you kind of get this idea that there must be something connected to what his child was investigating that probably led to his and his husband's demise. So Ike teams up with Buddy Lee, who is the father of the deceased Derek, and he's kind of your white hillbilly kind of guy. So it's got like a little bit of an updated lethal weapon sort of vibe to it where you've got this odd couple pairing, but it touches a lot on racial issues and homophobia and life in rural Vermont or uh, rural Virginia as they kind of get involved in tracking down who killed their kids and running afoul of a violent biker gang and having to return to their old ways of solving all of their problems with guns and fists and a whole lot of violence. And it is just a really, really solid read. I'm having a blast with this one, but kind of taking my time with it so I can enjoy it a bit more. And it's really, really good. So I would say if you're looking for a good crime noir revenge thriller, keep an eye out for this one. I'm going to read his stuff. I've heard lots of good things about him. He is really good. His last book, Blacktop Wasteland, came out, I think, last year. And although it wasn't his first book, it's kind of the one that put him on the map as the next big thing. And it's well-deserved, all of the accolades he's picked up. Yeah, there's a reason he's getting these accolades. He's a really good writer. His stories are great. Uh, he's just a blast to read. What was the name of this one, sorry? This one is called Razorblade Tears. Cool. That sounds really good. I like the sound of that. Yeah, I love bikers. I'm gonna add it to my to my cart. It's kind of like Lethal Weapon versus Sons of Anarchy. So <laughs> <laughs> perfect, David. What about any recommendations from you? Um, ooh, I've I, I watch I tend to watch at least one um, horror film a day. Uh, sometimes more. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> last one I watched. I've, I've been on quite a good run of watching some really good films actually. Um, the last one I watched yesterday or the day before even uh, was the Evil Dead remake, which I'm sure it's it's not exactly obscure. Most people listening to this have probably seen the Evil Dead remake. Mm-hmm. But if you haven't, check it out because it is absolutely fantastic. It is one of the best. It, it's not only one of the best horror remakes ever. It's um, I'd say it's one of the best horror films of the last 20 years or so. Uh, absolutely insane apocalyptically violent and bloody oh yeah uh, <laughs> uh, actual surprises in it it's a really nice little um uh, swap of who the main character is uh oh, just fantastic fantastic film that yeah that a- one they definitely had like buckets of blood in the budget for that one like <laughs> yeah they did <laughs> uh, the last, remember- last 10 minutes is just pouring rain but the rain is blood and it's yeah. just it's beautiful. I remember the, uh, when like the first trailers for that came out, and I remember thinking to myself, like, why the hell are they redoing like the Evil Dead? Like, like this, leave it alone. And then I watched it, and I was like, okay, well, that's why. Like, that's fantastic. See, funnily yeah. enough, first time I saw it in the cinema, I didn't really like it. I, I don't know. Maybe I went in and with that that attitude, like, because Evil Dead, the original one's pretty much my favorite film. So I went in thinking, oh, it's just no, they, they shouldn't bother remaking it and I, I saw it and I thought nah I wasn't into that and a few years later I watched the DVD and it completely flipped on it, it it's yeah I was just I was a fool I was a fool <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm bummed that Maya hasn't gotten her own franchise I don't know why they haven't sequelized the remake at all yet absolutely ridiculous she's brilliant well hopefully she'll turn up in the official Evil Dead 4 sequel yeah, Hopefully. we'll see. Let's put that out in the universe. I'm sure Bruce Campbell and Sam Raimi listen every week, so <laughs> hopefully they'll I mean, hear the people this. Be- the people behind that remake also did Don't Breathe, yes, which we're getting a sequel to, and Don't Breathe was fucking tense as hell. That's fantastic film as well. Yeah, I love that one. Had a great moment quite near the start, I'm sure. I might be remembering uh, correctly, uh, where they break into the house and then the camera pans for a couple of minutes through the house, showing you all the dreadful implements and weapons that are going to be used at some point in that film. Uh, it's just yes. a way to yeah. get you like, jazzed about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I don't think they show the turkey baster at the beginning, though, do they? Oh, possibly not. No, that's, <laughs> they, 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 they wait for that as a surprise. That's a that's a twist. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, um, Steve, what about you? Well, I actually don't watch a lot of movies, but I will uh, throw a curveball and say I actually watched a movie last night. Our son has been watching a lot of YouTube um, kind of like clay and play-doh um, videos where people make a bunch of monsters and stuff. And through that, he's really wanting to watch Beetlejuice. So we watched Beetlejuice last night for his first go through and probably the first time I've watched it in, I don't know, 20 years. And uh, uh, for a four-year-old, he sure held up well and he didn't... Uh, the only part that actually scared him was kind of near the start where the family's moving into the house after the uh, Matlins pass away and the one sculpture burst through the window in the kitchen. The, all of us jumped when that happened. I didn't even remember that part. <laughs> <laughs> we were all sitting there watching and he's getting a drink at the at the um, sink and suddenly that you know that weird kind of sculpture with the arms coming around the sides blasts through the window, and all of us jumped, and he screamed, and he, yeah, but yeah, he he went through, and his favorite thing was obviously the sandworms. It was either going to be the sandworms or the shrunken heads that were his favorite, because I I loved the shrunken heads as a kid. Like when he when he saw that, he asked us if that was real, and we were like, no, no, like that's just you know for the movie. But he actually really liked the part at the start where. Um, they first want to get rid of the people who've come in and they open the closet door when they're walking through the house and the wife's hanging there and she rips her face off and the eyeballs pop out <laughs> and, and both <laughs> were like, Oh my God, like here's nightmares. And he was like, her eyeballs just like flew out of her head. Like he thought it was like absolutely hilarious that she had ripped her face off and um, the eyeballs had flew out. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> really went on and then, uh, near the end there when they like you know how they pull their faces like super long and then she rips her face open and has the giant mouth oh um, yeah he was disappointed that they like went back to looking normal he thought they were going to stay looking like that for the rest of the movie <laughs> but, I was like, <laughs> but yeah overall um you know i don't know if i'm a big fan of the movie like now it doesn't really parts of it don't really hold up too well but it was fun to revisit it I haven't seen that movie in years, but it is written by one of my favorite horror novelists. Oh, um, it says uh, uh, Michael um, Michael McDowell. McDowell. Yeah, yeah. It is, isn't yeah. Like a lot of people realize he wrote Beetlejuice, but well, yeah, like his books are fantastic. But it's just kind of funny that he wrote that movie too. But no, Beetlejuice is a classic, and I remember seeing that as a kid and laughing at all the craziness of the movie myself. Yeah, and there's just so many like random little bonkers parts, like where um, they come out and they're walking down the hallway, and Beetlejuice turns the banister into the giant snake, and yes. he's like moving around, and he's wanting to um, uh, get the girl, and he wants to. He, he says something like, "I want to put my rattle up your your dress or something like that." Like, like he's so. He's so off sides when I watch it now, but I remember watching it thinking like when I was younger that this is a kid's movie. Like that's how it was for me it was, oh, I watched this like every week and with Robocop <laughs> at eight years old, like this is a kid's movie. And now when I like hear some of what he says, it's just like, what the hell? Like this is brutal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they did a kid's cartoon uh, after the movie. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, that was part of the course for the 80s, like, yeah, an adult franchise turn it into a kid's cartoon. Yeah, I mean, RoboCop was, there was a lot of marketing after that movie towards kids. You know, you had the RoboCop action figures and I had them comic books. It's like very much not a kid's film, people. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Rambo as well had its own cartoon series. That's right. Yeah. Yep. And Ghostbusters had its own cartoon series as well. I'd say Ghostbusters favorite. is a bit more kid friendly, but still, like, there's some stuff in those movies. Yeah, that was, I remember the for years I'd go, I went and see Ghostbusters. Must be when I was four or five or something, and my mum covered my eyes uh, during some of the scary parts. So it wasn't until it was on TV years later when I finally got to see like the library ghost and the terror dogs attacking Dana when she's in the chair. <laughs> <laughs> 
She didn't yeah. cover my the uh, the strange blowjob joke, if you remember that, which was kind yeah. of <laughs> TV versions. Which or Venkman yeah. going to his first date at Dana's apartment with a pocket full of date rape drugs. He just so <laughs> happens to have tranquilizers with him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was it's possessed. Everybody had those. Yeah, yeah. It was just a super big coincidence that she gets possessed and he happens to have tranquilizers with him. Super big coincidence. <laughs> well, I will say my last thing I did last week, I'm in the middle of two books that I feel happily recommending. And one is the new Eric LaRocca book. Things have gone worse since last we spoke. Um, that book's really been hard for me to put down and I've been absolutely loving it ever since I sort of, ever since I picked it up. And the other one I just started is uh, Chasm City by Alistair Reynolds. Oh. Which isn't a horror novel at all. It's a sci-fi. But it is one of the best sci-fi noir stories I've read in a very long time. Yeah, that was my introduction to Reynolds. I picked that up as a blind buy at Barnes & Noble way back in the day. Had no idea who this guy was and just saw the book and bought it and couldn't put it down. It's so fucked, and I, lo- I love how cynical it is. <laughs> but um, for movies, the last movie I saw last week is I decided to revisit Zack Snyder's Dawn of the Dead. Yeah. Which Another good one. I think that movie still holds up really well. It's The opening is still one of the best horror openings I think I've seen ever. Like, top five horror movie openings, I'd put that opening in. And... It's just a really well acted, really well shot, stylish zombie movie that kind of made zombies scary again with a question mark. <laughs> I think I think the better one is um twenty eight days later, even though they're technically infected, if you want to get specific. But I think like those two came out around the same time. I think twenty eight days later is a better movie. But Dawn of the Dead is so much fun to watch. Like, it's just a really fun trip, and I like it a lot. Yeah, I need to give that one another watch. I only saw it when it first came out on disc, and then bought the Scream Factory edition, and it's still sitting in its wrapper on my shelf, waiting for the <laughs> that rare magical day that I'll have time to watch a movie. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to Army of the Dead. Seeing Zack Snyder Return to Zombies, I think, should be a good time. Yeah, I hope so. It looks good. It does. Anything else from anybody else, or should we dive into Navajo? We'll actually throw one more shout out, but I just uh, finished reading last night, actually, to offer a blurb for uh, Edward Lorne and Darren uh, Ka- Kapoff, I think is how you say his last name. They did a mashup called The Wicked Rex of the West, awesome. which is the uh, Jurassic Park meets uh, Wizard of Oz. It is... <laughs> It is a book that started life on Twitter, um, as a lot of these kind of pairings seem to do now. And I guess it started where uh, Edward, or E, as most of us know him, had uh, tweeted or retweeted somebody's thing about, you know, what what two franchises should never come near each other. And Laurel Hightower, I guess, had responded with you know, Jurassic Park and... Uh, uh, Wizard of Oz, and from that, E and Darren kind of said challenge accepted, and they plot- <laughs> <laughs> they plotted out this world, and um, it's it's kind of like I-, I would say if like Ralph Bakshi wrote Jurassic Park meets Wizard of Oz, like it's um, there's a lot of very very offside stuff. It's um, you know kind of as you would expect from them, yeah, but it actually. It's a book I would never buy myself if I saw the synopsis or anything like that. Is that um, your book? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I try. Uh, I, I've tried Bizarro a few times, and I wasn't sure, you know, how Bizarro this would go. Uh, but it, it works. It's a, it's, a, it's a blast, and it it reads very cinematically. Like, you know, a lot of the descriptions and the stuff. Like, for instance. Um, uh, Dot uh, is the main kind of character. She gets transported to this crazy world that has Homo sapien park. Um, 
but she gets transported there in a dumpster because she's trying to hide out from some people. So she <laughs> to a, a dumpster and it gets picked up and her she grabs her little dog and when she ends up in their world, her dog actually turns into a velociraptor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just go crazy, but it's it's yeah, it was actually a pretty fun time. I was actually really surprised with you know how much of it I read and enjoyed and because you know I wasn't sure going in how much I would enjoy it, but it was actually a pretty fun time. That sounds like a lot of fun. E usually brings like the goods in his writing. Yeah. He's written like some bizarre stuff. stuff, but it's always fun. It was funny because there was a few like lines of dialogue where I was like, oh, like that's, that's completely E. Like, he, you know, it reads like one of his tweets where it's like, you know, um, I, I can't even think of it, but an, an example would be something like, you know, she farted faster than whatever. And you're like, oh, that was E. Like, <laughs> Like no, <laughs> other than E, and you know, you're just like, okay, that's that's where he was. So yeah, this sounds, sounds like great. a blast. <laughs> I'm looking forward to giving this one a read. I, I'm not 100 percent sure when the release date is. I have heard uh, Darren kind of allude to it possibly having like a limited through thunderstorm. Mm. Um, so I'm not sure if they're going to be doing you know, kind of a hardcover first of, you know, I, I think Thunderstorm usually does 50 or 52 copies. Yes. Um, and, and then it'll be going out to kind of, you know, the general public for um, ebook and paperback. But yeah, for, uh, that, that seems like a book that uh, a few of your listeners would probably really enjoy. I think so. I think it's a book I'm going to enjoy. And yeah, same if here. If it gets a Thunderstorm treatment, I'll see if I can swing the money by I just bought my last Thunderstorm book for a long time, though, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, they're they're a bit pricey. It's a luxury that I can't always get to. Uh, yeah. But I, I'm sure I'll be getting the ebook of this one. And I've been waiting for this one since those tweets first emerged. <laughs> <laughs> like Laurel does a, uh, a forward for it, and it, it, it lays out kind of how it came to be, but it really kind of sums up what you're about to dive into. <laughs> Well, bless Laurel for coming up with this idea. Well, I think it's it's good time to dive into the Navajo Nightmare. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think moving on from one book above co-written titles to another is probably a good enough transition. <laughs> so, what would you brought about the Navajo Nightmare? I was talking, we were talking to Dave before the. You joined Steve with the kind of escape kerfuffle going on. Yeah. But Dave said you guys came up with the idea about like two years ago when the idea yeah. kind of started percolating. Yeah, it was it was about three years ago where I submitted a story and I can't remember to who. I think it might have been it might have been Flame Tree was the um kind of the basis, which was the short story for Navajo Nightmare. And I remember I I had sent it to Dave to um uh, have him read it over and kind of give me some feedback. And he, he said it was a blast and that would be something that maybe in the future we should look at, you know, kind of expanding upon. And then it just kind of went from there. Yeah. Cause if you, my book, um, my second book night shoot came out in I think May 2019. And at the very back of that, it does promise coming soon, uh, dead girl blues and Navajo nightmare. Um, so definitely, we, were, we, we must have been properly on the cards by you know, like two years ago. So crumbs, I can't believe it's been yeah. So it's been three yeah. years since you did that that first one. Yeah, that that first story. Yeah, it was originally called like just like the version you sent me was just uh, a western story or something, wasn't it? It was called. Yeah, and I think actually one of your feedbacks to me was you need to give it a real title. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Dare we ask like, what that original title was, or was it just untitled at that point? I, I think it was just called a Western story, and I think that was, I think back then when I wrote it for submission, I was trying to be, you know, all, you know, cocky and like, oh, I'll name it a Western story because everybody will be sending in like, you know, zombie and werewolf stories for this <laughs> paranormal <laughs> element or whatever. I'll call it a Western story, and it'll be a Western story, and it'll blow their minds and. I think I like sent it away and like two weeks later, it was like a, a pass email came through. Um, and I was like, you know, like, son of a bitch. Like I really like this story. And, and then, yeah. So then that was kind of back then where 
you know, I think at that time, and David might correct me, we were we were trying to plot out kind of what we both individually were working on to figure out a time where we could kind of fit this in. And it wasn't well, until both of us kind of got shut down for COVID where we were like, let's just like, you know, let's bash out our first drafts kind of as fast as we can. So we have that and then we can start kind of tweaking it from there. Uh, yeah, I'm an absolute nightmare, an absolute fucking nightmare to work with because I work to my own schedule and no one else's. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I kept promising Steve, all right, yeah, yeah, um, I'm just going to finish this story and then I'll start working on Navajo. Uh, and then, you know, six months would go by, I was working on something else. And then suddenly I would message him and say, right, I've written a, a synopsis. Here we go. And then it would sit for another six months or something um well done steve for persevering because it'd be very easy for you to have just said ah fuck this uh, oh can i swear yeah yeah oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. well, what you're saying david is you're the reason this took three years 100 percent, yes. okay <laughs> <laughs> but in, in his defense um in that time he also edited about 42 of my own releases so <laughs> <laughs> how many of you got lined up for me now steve how many edits uh, how many is, there's a novel coming isn't there yeah i'll message you later <laughs> <laughs> yeah but no, steve's absolutely right yeah it was uh, finally a uh, covid uh the the lockdown happened so i i finished um i must have just finished maggie's grave uh and yeah. i moved on to something else and i wrote a, a novella i think very quickly and then suddenly I had some spare time I had loads of spare time it was absolutely marvellous and that's when Navajo finally finally happened once we started the way Steve I mean what we were talking like it, it, the, the first draft was done in two weeks or something oh if that like I remember um, it was ridiculous because me and you we like we've been messaging like via Twitter for a number of years even before um, we started kind of working together with you, working on my stuff. Yeah. And, but then it was like COVID hit and we both ended up, we actually did like our first kind of official Skype chat where, you know, um, we realized neither of us were catfishing each other. We actually looked like we looked like. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> and so we just kind of said like, let's put like kind of everything else just to the back burner and let's just, you know, go through this and get it done. And yeah, I think it was like within two weeks, we both had our own kind of major sections done. And then I think we, we let it sit for maybe a month or two after, and then we went back through. And then from there, it's just kind of been fine tuning and making sure the, the kind of continuity happens because for those who, who don't know, part one is from David and part two is from me. And we, we kind of decided to, have like a before and after with how um the story folded because we didn't really know how else to we didn't want to have it where because i think originally david it was like one of your chapters and then one of mine and then one of yours and one of mine and we didn't want the reader to get confused by it bouncing around yeah it wasn't going to work at all i tried doing it to just split them into every possible way but then um huge spoilers for the book coming up a uh, very early on in Steve's one, you find out that uh, Charles is the Navajo nightmare. Uh, and so for my story to have any impact whatsoever, I would have had to have wrapped up before, I think, chapter 12 of Steve's 27 chapter story. So, yeah, it is, we decided to split it into the two. And my God, I'm happy we did because I think it works so much better. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we'll just chime in here, at least for like the first half is... I didn't expect, like, I knew this is a horror story going into it, but I didn't expect it to be as brutal as it actually was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you definitely get David's love affair with the Giallo and splatter flicks in that first part. It's <laughs> wonderfully done. Yeah, and, and for me, I think I think that's what kind of elevates, and I hate using that phrase because, again, it sounds douchey. Um, <laughs> but, um, you can I think be douchey, Steve. It's okay. We expect yeah, nothing cool. less. Yeah. It kind of elevates the the emotional aspect of it because you really do feel, you know, everything that's happened to Charles is brutal. And, you know, it's kind of like brutality begets brutality where he's – he that flip switch where he's like, okay, eye for an eye, 
and and all of this happens and then for my section i kind of use that to be like well now he's this kind of pained and tortured guy who's just trapped in this endless cycle of violence and you know how how can he get out of it how can he how can his spirit finally rest so i i think it might have even been you richard who said the the first half is really like brutal in your face and the second half feels a bit more introspective and i think by putting David's before and Steve's after, I think that worked really well. Mm -hmm. I I agree. You know, chapter to chapter, it'd be like, Oh my God, like this happened. And then, you know, they're riding their horses through this area and, you know, you know, our, our lawman Tanner is wondering if he's going to get a blow job from Linda, you know? So it kind of like, (laughs) (laughs) and, and, and just a note on the brutality part, like, like, I think, it's almost a, a joke, but like when you look at um, Seth MacFarlane's, you know, Western comedy that he did, that kind of even inspired me that movie because, you know, there's a throwaway line in there where it's like, well, we live in the West. Like if we get a cut, we get infected and we die. Like back then it was, you know, kill or be killed. And so I really liked that David just went full blast into, you know, it's pretty lawless. It's pretty, um, you know, uh, uh, you know that that idea of you know the the biggest and the baddest gets what he wants and and takes what he wants and that was I think very accurate to a lot of that time period. Yeah, you know, I could agree with that. Yeah, it's definitely no holds barred. Uh, it's also what I really liked about it was this examination of like in order to get these monsters, Charles Anderson has to become a monster. You get that really neat morality kind of play with it. One thing that I'm curious about though is well steve this started out for you as a short story which i believe is available on your website for readers yeah i have not read it yet but i'm curious how much of that story was cannibalized to produce this book or if it's something that's kind of set in the middle in the book we get before and after i'm wondering if there's something that takes place during so it really the only so um, in my in my half of the book, Tanner gets this letter from Linda that you know essentially is is uh, hiring him to kind of avenge her husband's death. So the short story is you know Vice President Johnson has hired um, kind of the flashiest showman, this um, you know this speed shooting gunman to to go and kill the Navajo Navajo nightmare who's been. Um, you know, uh, kind of decimating these towns over there. So the short story is really just, um, you know, in terms of relating to the book, it's kind of, it gives Linda her why as to why she has hired Tanner. But in the grand scheme of things, you don't miss anything by not reading it. But if you do read it, it gives a little bit more. Um, But it's pretty much completely unrelated to any of David's section. Yeah, it's almost like a, a prologue to your one, I'd say, Steve, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, and I know at one point me and you had even discussed, like, do we include that in mm. in the book or, um, you know, and if we do, where do we put it? Or And I think that's when we just decided, um, you know, I'll just throw it on on my website because it is it is a story that's at the end of one of my own releases, The Girl Who Hid in the Trees. Like, it's a bonus story that I... I tacked in on that one. So it is, it is out there. I totally forgot about that. Yeah. It's in, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> By the way, just so, just so you know, um, this is only the second time. I'm right, Steve saying this is the second time we've ever actually spoken, not on like social media. Yeah. Oh yeah. We, we, I mean, we probably message a half dozen times a day, but yeah, in terms of actually physically communicating, this would be time number two. The internet has made collaborations a hell of a lot easier. <laughs> it really has. I couldn't imagine this project coming off the ground if, you know, this was like the 80s. You know? <laughs> How does a guy in Canada meet up with David over in, was it Wales? Scotland. Scotland. Yeah. That's it, just sending it back and forth, my goodness. Yeah. yeah. And like, Do this by telegram. <laughs> like pigeon. <laughs> Now, I believe it was in your foreword, Steve, that you had talked a bit about your grandfather and the stories that he shared with you. What kind of stories did he share that gave Genesis to this story? Yeah, my grandpa, like he was, he was a pretty interesting guy in that, 
you know, he was kind of born, born at that kind of right, perfect time right after world war one, where then when world war two came around, he, he wasn't able to go over there. I think he was a little too old at that time, but like where I grew up, like I grew up in the, like literally the middle of nowhere in British Columbia, Canada. And so like my, his, his like relatives founded where I grew up. So there's like a, a mountain that's named after us there. And where the original town site was when it was flooded um, to build a dam, my grandpa's house was the first house that was moved to the new town site. And, um, and it's, actually, it's honestly quite annoying. Cause when I go back, anytime I go back, you know, I'm related to 90% of the people there. So everybody wants to talk and, Oh, you know, I haven't seen you forever. And so, you know, he just, he literally was a guy of the land there where he was a logger. He had a, he had a trap line. Um, when he was growing up, there used to be a, uh, an area near where I grew up called Grizzly. Basin. So Grizzly Basin at one time had the largest percentage of grizzly bears in all of North America living in this, this kind of basin. But in order to get up there, um, they had to go by horseback with some of the local indigenous people. So it was just this, um, you know, this, this kind of guy who did all of that stuff. Right. So he really, you know, he was always reading Westerns and watching Westerns. So it just really inspired me. Well, that's cool. Now, given his background and love of Westerns, David, you kind of came from the opposite end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had no interest in Westerns at all uh, as a child, although, like, I mean, my, we, we lived in uh, a Scottish city, the capital city of uh, Scotland, um, and my dad was from Sweden, so we have absolutely no connections whatsoever to the uh, to America or the West or anything. Um, I don't know, you'd, you'd, think, you'd think growing up in Scotland you'd have a lot of connections to Westerns. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I was making a joke. Um, we've got a lot of connections to the Vikings through my... Uh, my Swedish dad, but um, I've maybe that's an idea. Viking horror. Oh, hang on, file that one away. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, my dad, of course, he grew up. I, I grew up with him watching westerns, and I thought it was just you know those lame, uh, boring western things. I had no interest. I was insanely obsessed with horror from a very, 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 very young age, uh, and it wasn't until probably about my. Uh, mid late teens or something when I finally watched Once Upon a Time in the West, the Sergio Leone film. And Ooh, realized that's a good that, one. Oh, it's just it's one of the best films I've ever seen. Ever. It's incredible. And the the music by Ennio Morricone is oh honestly I think I, I think I'd have that played at my funeral. Yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> just planned my funeral on air. Um yeah. <laughs> From that point on, I just got obsessed mostly with the sort of spaghetti Western ones because the Italian Westerns of the 60s tended to go a little bit more gothic, a little bit more sinister, weird, violent, things like Django, um, Kioma, things like that. I, I always definitely the, the more horrific side always appealed to me. The best American one I think I've seen would be... Um, Clint Eastwood's High Plains Drifter. You guys seen that? Oh, that's a really good one. Yeah. yeah that's just... amazing. Yeah, because that, that's pretty much, that's, that's uh, certainly horror adjacent, that one, where he comes back to, to the town and at the end they paint the entire town red and rename it Hell and await for these bad guys to come in for revenge. Oh, it's, it's yeah, that's a wonderful film. That was probably the biggest influence on me along with, rather bizarrely, um, the 70s TV show Little House on the Prairie, which I grew up watching on Sunday mornings before my mum went to church. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that was uh, Charles Ingalls in uh, Little House on the Prairie was probably the uh, a big... Imagine Charles Ingalls from Little House crossed with Clint Eastwood from High Plains Drifter, and that's how I envisaged uh, Charles Anderson. The Navajo nightmare that he ends up becoming... How much of this was based off of Native American mythology or was just made up? Was there a lot of research that went into these concepts for the supernatural elements? Yeah, well, so for, for the short story, I, wa I, I wanted to ground it in reality as much as I could. So I, 
you know, uh, went to Google and, and found a place kind of in uh, Northeast California that had a pretty good uh, backstory and history of, you know, through the gold rush and um, what happened afterwards. Um, because the one, one thing I found kind of when I was researching it is typically the most violent times wasn't so much when these towns were prospering and, um, you know, and, and the, the, everything was booming. It was as the crash kind of started, and mm-hmm. a lot of people who, you know, uh, money and had the resources, they would leave, and it would kind of leave the the lower kind of point or the, um, uh, the guys who didn't have the to get out. They, they essentially would be the ones who, you know, they had nothing le- to lose because they had nowhere to go, and that was when a lot of the violence would happen. So. From there, that was when I, I kind of stumbled upon the story of, um, you know, these two different tribes that had some in them. And those tribes were kind of how I put um, the, the the character of the Navajo together. And then I used those two tribes to actually create the character of Cutting Teeth from my section. And, and the name Cutting Teeth actually came because I was listening to a band called The Haunted. And they have a song called Cutting Teeth. And I thought, man, that's a fantastic name for this character. So I kind of, you know, yoinked that and, and used it because it worked so well for his his story. Because I knew if I kept that character as is, when I sent it to David for editing, he would say, you know, I need a better, we needed to think of a good name because that's that's usually my problem is I won't name people for a bit. And then when I send it to him, he'll he'll email me back and say, like you gotta, you gotta name these characters. It can't just be the mom. It can't just be the dad. Um, so for their, for a bit, their cutting teeth didn't really have a name. And then uh, knowing what I would, the email I would get back, that's when I, I, I figured it. Out. So, so like, so that you make me sound like a monster. There you. Um, the the short story um, Navajo Nightmare uses a very specific um, weapon. And that was, um, you know, accurate to the time period. And then once we kind of got going, we kind of went and, and did our, our own kind of take on that stuff. With cutting teeth. It sounds like the name came first and then you developed his background based off of that name. No, actually the opposite. Because I, I had the story of him kind of being this, um, you know, this abandoned skinwalker type character who... So originally, you know, uh, his family gets slaughtered and he gets taken in by this other tribe. But this other tribe is actually a tribe of skinwalkers. And so his backstory is he he's a boy with no name um, because he's not in this tribe. And it's not until you know, his name day kind of gets called that he finds his name by, um, you know, uh, figuring out that he can actually change turn into uh, a skinwalker very cool I Rich, know, you totally that name from the haunted i'm gonna have to check that song out now <laughs> oh that's the, the swedish death metal band yeah yep yeah cool <laughs> what do you say mike i was gonna ask what your question was oh i was gonna ask about the research that you guys had to do with this book like how were you trying to make it as historically accurate as possible or were you just kind of writing it and then checking facts after the, after it was done and since you needed to change? A bit of both, really, I would have said. So um, for my part, um, I wasn't going for sort of full, you know, immersive realism. Uh, it's more like, much like the spaghetti westerns in a way, uh, mine was, was based on a, a sort of idealised version of the West, that sort of cinematic idea of the Old West. Although I did have an incredibly helpful, indispensable book called The Writer's Guide to Everyday Life in the Wild West, which is where we used, uh, I used that for mine and Steve's one for um, for just getting the little facts, the little details right. Because you, you want you want to create enough realism that it grounds people in the story that they can believe it. So things like what they ate for dinner, like jackrabbit stew and stuff like that, anything those little details uh, are from that fantastic book, um, which is really expensive, probably because everyone's writing the rest of it. But, uh, uh, yeah, anything fantastic? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, on my end, it was more, um, 
because your your part of it is more centered around Charles and and becoming this monster, and my end was more um, you know dealing with the the backstory of some of these characters who kind of meet up to go find this guy. So I wanted to make sure you know when I used words that now are 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 you know, deemed offensive that it was in a correct context, and and I put that in the forward too that um, you know now you know we wouldn't. Uh, you know, people wouldn't refer to them as, you know, natives or, you know, stuff like that. But back then, um, that was very, that was a common vernacular. And, and a lot of them that was used, you know, as an offensive word or, or whatever. So we wanted that to be accurate that, you know, if, um, for instance, there's a, a, a kind of a bit at the start of mine where um, Tanner's kind of right-hand man, the young kid, you know, makes a comment and, and Tanner kind of, you know, almost gives him the backhand and tells him like, you know, you know, he's a man just because he's, you know, indigenous doesn't make him any less than that or whatever. So it was, you know, we wanted people that if they read it, they wouldn't be offended because they would know what we were trying to do, but we still want them to know it was like that, that, that phrase would be meant offensively, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think as well, because quite uh, very often I see when, um, uh, well, generally when sort of white male authors uh, write things up to have racism and stuff in it, it's almost like they, uh, and I'm generalizing a bit here, but they, like they take a glee in using racial slurs and things like that, and they just start throwing them about, almost like they're thinking, I can finally write this. Whereas I think we, we yeah, heard... That's, that's the worst. It, yeah, it's very obvious when that starts to happen. I mean, when you're reading something, you're just like, you're reveling in this opportunity to say these words a bit too much. Um, So I hope that me and Steve handled it better than that, certainly. (laughs) Yeah, no, I can can relate completely after my Salem Holly series, which involves a former slave in post-revolutionary war America. There's definitely now taboo subjects and words that are used, but I was conscious of it. I tried not to overdo it or make it seem like it was something that I was reveling in. Um, but I probably still should have put a warning on there similar to what Steve did. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know, Mike, I read that book. It seemed like you were kind of reveling in it. Just, just I? I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> well, I mean, I did have several readers that have not cared for the book because the villains are not woke enough. You know, they yeah. they are very much 1800s era white guys, slave owner type people. And it was not the best period for black Americans to be living in. But it was something that I was conscious of and tried not to overindulge in. So I certainly understand where you guys are coming from. Yeah. And I think we handled it, you know, I mean, I think as the writers of it, I think we handled it well. Obviously, once it goes out to the reader, you're kind of. You know, it's out of your hands, but I hope that they understand like our intention behind it because yes, um, yeah, and, it, and it's something like I think I just saw a, a, re, a review too where one of the negatives was, um, you know, all of the all of the characters kind of on my side of it and and David's side had you know really brutal backstories and again, you know, I think we even. T- I think at one point David emailed me and said, like, we need to tone some of it down because, you know, it's a bit much. And, uh, and, but that, that's the unfortunate reality of, you know, um, in the West. yeah, like my one character is this giant black guy who was bought, you know, in, into, uh, uh, as a slave when he was a kid and he thought the, the daughter of the family loved him when really, you know, she didn't. And, you know, things just, you know, that was just how it was, unfortunately. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm sorry it was brutal, but their lives were brutal. Yeah. Yeah. There's no, there shouldn't be any sugarcoating of that. And his background was absolutely heartbreaking. I think he was one of the more tragic figures for me in your side of the story, Steve. And the things that he experienced are certainly gutting. Oh yeah. 100%. One thing I found interesting is the character, like the central character of the Navajo Nightmare by Charles Anderson. Do you kind of see him as, was he fully like reformed and trying to make a good life? Or was there always kind of the monster 
beneath the skin with his character. I saw him as uh, he he is a man trying to do the right thing. Um, I mean, he does say, you know, it's once you, you you never forget how to kill things like that. It's it's probably always going to be bubbling below the surface. It's like someone who's um, you know, quit drinking or, or kicked heroin or something, you know, can you ever fully lose that? Almost like a <laughs> craving, the adrenaline. Um, yeah. The one thing that he believed he was, that he was good at was uh, tracking and killing people. Um, so I, I'd like to think, yes, he, he would have reformed. I mean, he still couldn't, he, he can't help showing off a bit and, uh, and, and, and he would be sort of seeking justice, you know, when those, those men are harassing his wife at the start. But uh, yeah, I, I'd like to think Charles was uh, was he was, he was gonna live a good life. I'm sure of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe he has his opportunity in between cycles. Absolutely. Maybe. <laughs> I will not. say that that scene with with uh, Charles's wife and kid that that was oh. unexpectedly <laughs> brutal. When God. I was reading it. <laughs> that, that was unexpected for me as well <laughs> but that wasn't <laughs> I was wondering how much of the brutality was planned and how much of it just came about as you were writing was there ever a moment like oh I gotta go really over the top here and <laughs> well, originally think, it was, it, it, yeah I'm sure he found her crucified and the, the kid was dead and then just you know when you're writing and you just like you almost move into sort of autopilot where you're not even you're not conscious that you're writing, and it just somehow the kid's head ended up in her hollowed out stomach, and uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember at one point when we we both we each had so on my side of it, um, things were a a bit more brutal with some uh, raping and stuff like that, and and I think it was around the time another book had come out, I think, and some of the backlash was specifically about some of the rape. And, and I know me and you had been talking about, you know, toning some of that down. And I remember you had emailed me or, or messaged me and you said, Oh yeah, like you definitely need to tone this down. And then you messaged me right after and you're like, Oh, I just like had the best, like best kill of, of like Charles. <laughs> and I was like, what? Like, like okay, like I guess I guess I'll I'll tone mine down, but you destroy that little kid, you know. It was like <laughs> moments of, um, and I remember there was one time too where you you had sent me something to read, and then you said, "Oh no, don't read that," because I think I accidentally turned Charles into a vampire. Um, so <laughs> it's funny, kind of how some of this stuff progressed as you were going along. Yeah, I, I, I even try to remember what that was about. I mean, Charles. <sighs> yes oh god yeah 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 no yeah ignore me <laughs> ignore me i'm having a a senior moment here yeah I, no i can't think what that is what, what i was referring to there i think it was related to when he's he meets those guys in the woods i think that's what it was oh when he starts to have the sort of blood cravings because lester's like um beginning to take over him yeah 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 okay yeah oh, i moved that i, I, I kind of kept in but i moved it towards the end of the uh, in the brothel um, yeah but then you also kind of kept it more of uh i would say a killing craving versus a you know slitting the neck and drinking the blood craving yeah that i'm glad it sounds like i'm glad i took that out because that sounds a bit silly <laughs> 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 well that kind of clears up a little bit another issue that I was wondering about with separating it into the two halves and I'm presuming writing your draft simultaneously over that two week period was how much deliberation there was with David being up front with the more violent and grotesque elements whereas Steve your end of the book is a little bit more deliberately paced and introspective and a bit more somber you're dealing with older characters David is dealing with these characters more at the beginning of their life, so to yeah. speak. And Steve, yours are more at the end of their days. Was that always the plan or just something that came out in the writing? Pretty much, as far as I remember, was more. And again, when we first started, we didn't have the plan of doing the um, the before or the after. It was let's interweave these two kind of stories together and 
And and I, and I know David's ex, uh, described it a few times as kind of that you know split EP between two of your favorite bands um, that works really well, but they may have different styles. And and you know I think overall, like when you look at the our bodies of work, we're we're, we're similar but different enough that I think it worked really well for that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think yeah. it was kind of, as we kept going along, that's where we were able to you know, almost kind of plug and play as to how we wanted things to, to play off of each other. And when we were first doing the, uh, potential of, you know, uh, one section being David, the me, then David, the me, or however we were going to do it. You know, I remember we sent a few messages back and forth being like, okay, like in this chapter, you need to make sure this happens because I've written this and it alludes to this. And, mm-hmm. and that was kind of what we we're like, you know, what, this is getting way too convoluted. How much of a time gap do you think there is between the before and after portion? Like I was trying to gauge how long Anderson has been this Navajo nightmare by the time Tanner and his company comes along. It seemed like it was, was a while. Yeah, I was kind of hoping people wouldn't think that because it's probably not as long as I would like the gap to be because it is set in this sort of Old West period, which, you know, doesn't have – that huge uh, uh, a range of years. Yeah. Um, ideally, it, it would be like a hundred years or something. You know? Right. But I'm it's just, probably a lot less. <laughs> I'm just thinking, like, you know, there's some room for more stories in between. Yeah, it's probably like six minutes, honestly, with the way well, it rolls out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we need like a flash fiction then. Well, <laughs> yeah, happy a few people. People asking for um, more stories set in uh, set in this universe, which is quite quite fun. Because I I, yeah. I mean I, I think I can speak for you as well here, Steve 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 Strand, uh, Steve, and say that we really really enjoyed writing this one. <laughs> it was a lot of yeah. fun. And I think part of it too is just that you know um, not that we don't take ourselves seriously, but we had no. Um, like when I'm working on my own stuff, I kind of have it back in the back of my mind of, of kind of when I want it to come out. Uh, and this was just us being like, okay, let's just, you know, let's kind of blast through this initial draft and, you know, then we'll get back to it and then we'll get, and so there was never any like deadline or time crunch or, um, you know, kind of this forced finish period for us to do it. It was just, you know, like, Oh man, I just wrote this and, it's crazy. And then, you know, it was just a kind of back and forth of um, almost a break from our own individually forced, um, you know, deadlines of, of our own stuff. So it was, it was a blast. Yeah. Also a break from our own, uh, certainly maybe even more so for me, a break from our own sort of standards styles. Cause my books are all modern day, generally young people facing off against some supernatural threat. Um, so it was really nice to write something very very different uh, set in the past with a male main character and stuff different time period different types of characters uh yeah it felt really freeing um to to do that and also like you say yeah about the time uh, about the um like re- release date and things because as an independent author you kind of you know i'd love to sit and work on books for years and years and years and years until they're absolutely perfect mm-hmm. but you can't go that long uh, as an indie author because you get like a you put a book out it sells well for a bit then it starts to tail off until your next one comes out so it's it's tough so it, yeah it was nice to just forget about that for this one and just totally relax and it went it, we released it when it was ready even though it took a few years to get ready it seems like it releases at a very fortuitous time we've we're in the middle of a bit of a Western horror renaissance, thanks to Death's Head Press, and we've got T.C. Parker's Salvation Spring released recently. How do you guys feel about joining this fray? Are you kind of kicking yourselves that you're releasing it now, or would you have released uh, or, it sooner? Or <laughs> The original plan was certainly for it to be out in the uh, probably winter 2019. That was why I originally thought. But I wonder, part of, part of me certainly is like, oh, now it looks like we're just jumping on a bandwagon because there's this big, this great new trend of horror westerns. But also, I think it has worked in our favor as well, because uh, 
they've they've sort of laid the groundwork almost at their press because I've actually not read any of their westerns, but they sound like they're pretty terrific. Um, so it's it's maybe fortuitous that uh, that we've waited until <laughs> until they put a few of them out and and whet everyone's yeah. appetite for more. It, it's funny because I know like I know a few times we were like you know pr- pretty we we didn't want the, any of the dialogue to come off hokey or you know kind of that classic like almost like that american like yeehaw western like we wanted it to be pretty pretty tight and pretty brutal and then i think that you know kind of as um death's head came along i think that helped to turn people's you know eyes towards the fact that you know you can write a, a really solid western and then have these horror elements so for us, yeah. I think really the only thing that we discussed um, actively about trying to separate ourselves from, you know, being almost like you said, David, like we never wanted to jump on a trend. It would just happen to be that by the time we got our act together, all of this other stuff was coming out um, was really the cover. But even from, you know, back back when we first kind of got our draft done and discussed it. And I think is it just Justin Coons who does the Death Head stuff? Oh yeah, um, yeah, he's like, like, the Death Head stuff. His, his artwork is you know fantastic, but I don't think that fits our story at all. So you know, for us, it was really we wanted that, uh, and I think me, when we first started talking, we were talking about kind of that older you know Western movie poster look, and then it kind of morphed into that old comic style paperback that. You know, it would just be beat up because it was in the cowboy pants and stuff. So it's really nice. Yeah. And yeah, because the books are dedicated to your uh, papa, to have that sort of nineteen forties type comic book sort of thing that maybe he he might have you know read. <laughs> yeah, it just because the story it is there's an old fashioned almost like a fable esque quality to to the story in in some ways where it's not the necessarily the the ultra gritty sort of style that, that some of the, the some of your modern horror westerns seem to be. So yeah, I think uh, yeah, and, yeah, and me one of the things that I've enjoyed so far, and like I I try not to read a ton of the reviews and stuff, and and you know because again the book goes out and you know whatever the reader finds the reader finds and that's great. But the one thing I have seen a lot that's really kind of made me you know not so much externally smile but internally smile is a lot of people have said they've read this and it's felt very nostalgic and it reminded them of, you know, when they, you know, either watched or read Westerns when they were um, younger with their grandparents or parents. And so for that, that's, I think that's been one of the things I've enjoyed the most is I think we really, really did capture kind of that time period and that vibe of how things used to kind of be before, you know, Hollywood cinema overtook a lot of the Western stuff. Well, that's nice to hear. I honestly, your your book felt more like I've read one of the Splatter westerns, and I would say your book feels more like a kind of gritty traditional western story, especially with a lot of how it's kind of formatted. And I think, in my opinion, I think it helps your book stand out a bit more than some of the other Splatter west like the Splatter westerns that I've read. Um, but I'm also kind of a Western fan myself, so. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> it's quite tough. Well, I've had thought... people asking me, um, oh, I like your books, but I don't like Westerns. Will I enjoy this one? And I'm kind of like, I don't really know what the answer is to that. Yeah. <laughs> like, the answer is yes. Yeah. The answer, <laughs> the answer is give it a try. Yeah, exactly. That's why I said. I said, if you enjoyed Mother Books, yeah, you'll, you might like this one. I'm not yeah. going to guarantee anything, but... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, spend the three or four bucks on the Kindle. Give it a try. Exactly. And see, the bonus to me is that, um, you know, if they start reading it and they don't like it and they DNF, well, that's, you know, they didn't like David's stuff, so they'll still might. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. All right, okay. <laughs> Mr. It's written by David Sodergren and Steve Stred. <laughs> It's However, a great way for David to become the fall guy. Yeah. <laughs> well, I am going to join the chorus of voices and say we need more. Yeah. yeah. I think more stories set in this world would be kind of cool. Oh, well, thanks. I'd, be happy nice to to see, I'd definitely be happy to see this like expanded upon. 
And I found this book to be really hard to put down. Like once I started reading it, I just had to keep on going. Yeah. And I read like both sections in one sitting each. My kids made me spread it out a little bit more, but I tore through this pretty quickly. It was not one that I wanted to stop. I needed to find out what the hell was going to happen, what the hell they were going to do next. How was David going to top the head and a torso scene? (laughs) (laughs) And something for book two. (laughs) And how Tanner and his crew were going to meet up, how these stories were going to intersect. I found Steve's portion to be very complimentary. I'm glad that you guys broke it up the way that you did. I think had it been alternating chapters, it would have been a little too much interruption in the flow. Yeah, I think we would have seen too many disparities in styles and tone. So I think going the before and after approach was incredibly smart. Yeah, I've got a spreadsheet somewhere which has all the chapters, various different versions where I'm trying to put them in in an order, going back and forth, and it never even came close to working. Not not even for a second. So yeah, it's definitely yeah. the, the right. Yeah, and at one point, we were trying to figure out where each of our kind of major kind of cliffhangers would be so that that's where, you know, uh, the first quarter of David's section would end and then mine would start and then I would end. And yeah, just, and, you know, and uh, I, I remember we even had a, a, a brief convo on, you know, does it, does it take away from people's expectations on thinking it's just, you know, David and Steve written this one whole thing together. And, and I think it works better that, you know, I I gave him feedback on his, and he gave feedback on mine, and and it I think it heightened each section, but then it works really well that it's these kind of individual story parts that work together. It also maybe cuts down on some of the arguments on when you're co-writing straight up one line to the next, like oh we've got to have this character do this, like no you asshole don't change my line. <laughs> Yeah, Steve, let's never try that because, like, uh, I, I am very obnoxious if we uh, <laughs> get into that. Motherfucker, this is gold. This dialogue is gold. You can't <laughs> touch it. I'm just thinking of some of the feedback I've got from you on some of my own stuff when you've been editing it. When I'm like reading through the notes, and it's like, is it like you'll leave a note like, isn't this like your 13th novel? Like, how the hell did you write a line this crappy? <laughs> <laughs> I've never said that. Never. <laughs> Something similar, I'm sure. Maybe for your tenth novel. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, no, no, we we will never go that route. Well, then what <laughs> no, kind of drama did you run into? Feel well, free really, to make something up. No, really, nothing. I think, and and I think part of it is too is we're both um, uh, we are both like bo- neither of us really have any kind of actual ego in that way, and both of us wanted kind of the best story that we could put out there. So you know, I think anything that would have possibly been you know well let's call it confrontational i think we both kind of maybe edited it out ourselves like you know so at one point so in my section you know they're they're riding along and they come across this mother and her twins who have who have died um and then they came across a guy who had been killed and stuff and then so there was like some some definitely more brutal elements i had put in there um regarding you know as sodomy and blood and rape and stuff. And, you know, it was one of those ones where I, I think the one time I messaged David and said, I don't think this works. Do you think this works? And he said, Nope. And then, you know, changed it and on we went. So it was, it was pretty seamless, at least on my end, David could be, you know, shaking his fist at his roof right now over, over this. But I, I, I thought it was pretty seamless. Oh, I absolutely agree. Yeah. Yeah. You're an absolute dream to work with. If anyone's ever looking for a collaborator, Steve <laughs> is an absolute dream to work with. It's very, very patient. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you guys think you might collaborate on another novel in the future that might not be a Western, but something else? I would say probably. I, I mean, at some point, we both have uh, we we both typically have a lot on the go, and I've. I've pitched a few things his way, and I mm-hmm. think one of them, I think one of them's kind of, you know, uh, stuck and kind of hit hit the wall, and 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 where we may see <clears> about <throat> possibly doing it. But again, it's one of those ones where neither of us, I think, are really at the point of 
like let's physically plot out a time to do it. It's more of a, you know, when it happens, it happens. Yeah, I'm currently working on four novels at once, which is ridiculous, which wow. is probably going to take me up wow. to about the end of probably the end of 2022 or something. And how many, what are you working on, Steve? Quite a lot, probably. Uh, three novels and eight novellas. <laughs> <laughs> So a couple. Of things. Uh, so yeah, what, what, if we can find some time, I would uh, I would like to work with Steve again. Absolutely, yeah. Steve, if you do collaborate again, are you going to fight for top billing? <laughs> um, no, because I think uh, I think technically you go alphabetically, right? So Sodergren comes before Stred. I mean Lincoln and Child, they went the other way out. Uh, okay. Uh, and, See, um, I, this was one of our one our few disagreements because I thought it should be Stred and Sodergren because I viewed it more originally as your sort of like your baby because you know it was your original idea and it was uh, dedicated to your your grandfather and stuff. Um, so I I had suggested Stred and Sodergren and you twisted my arm <laughs> and made my name. <laughs> <laughs> I I think just you know it's kind of like you. And, and I almost hate to throw this analogy out there because at some point I'll come back. But you know how we all have those married couples who their names just kind of flow together. And, and so and, and then if you try to say their names the other way, you're like, well, that doesn't work at all. And for me, the whole time I was thinking, you know, solder going to shred like to me that just flowed. But then shred. And so I don't know, something about it just seemed almost a bit harsh. And I don't know if it's just that kind of single harsh of of my last name that's condensed for releasing that yeah you know, the hard consonant into the and isn't as nice yeah. as the end yeah you're right yeah uh, so for me it was always you know even though like you had said um it started out kind of as my short story idea to me it just didn't have that kind of natural ring or flow that it does when it's Sodergren and Strad. yeah i agree I mean, if worse comes to worse, you could always go Stred and Sodergren and open up a law firm. <laughs> I wouldn't hire us. <laughs> I'll tell you. <laughs> this episode should be releasing in July. I know, Steve, you'll have something new coming out. Why don't you guys tell us about forthcoming releases? Yes. Uh, well, the next one that I'll have will actually be the the trilogy finale of My Father of Lies trilogy. Um, Sacrament, which comes out on June first, and then uh, and then after that, I, I probably nothing until September or so. So oh. that'll be wow, it's a, on, um, it's a big gap. Yeah, it'll depend on uh, uh, when uh, David has time to edit this novel. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I um I have one novel that's completely finished, uh, and one very very. very very, very nearly finished. I'm just in the final little bits of editing. And one of them will be out by July. But it kind of depends. I've got two cover artists currently working on two different covers, and it's probably going to come down to whichever cover artist gets their cover to me first. That'll be the one that's out, um, because they're both going to be ready. Uh, So because I'm not sure which one it is, uh, I won't give any titles. But they're definitely... um, One's a a 70s set revenge, sort of very violent revenge story. And one is more of a a thriller, almost mainstream, a little bit lighter, but then also gets very, very unpleasant. Um, Yeah. (laughs) One of those will be out. Who knows? Well, I'm excited for both of those. I'm also excited for the stuff you have coming up, Steve. I'll be sure to check all those out when I can. Yeah, I did pre-order the conclusion to the Father of Lies series the other day, so I really got to fucking get caught up on these. <laughs> yeah, <I need laughs> You're already finished with too. it. That, I, I've read that, and it's absolutely a terrific conclusion to the trilogy, but I'll tell you something. Steve's, fo- is it a foreword or an afterword? Are you, are you doing it as Steve? Afterward. That is, that is unbelievable 
They, like that sounds like a strange thing to say, but the afterword to this book is an absolute must read. The book itself is also a must read. It's fantastic. But this afterword, my God, chilling, absolutely chilling, frightening stuff. Well, that awesome. is a hell of a tease. Yes, it is. Well, I can't wait to dive in. And David and Steve, where can our listeners get in touch with you guys at? Oh, uh, uh, David's cell phone number is... Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, well, you can you can find me on uh, Twitter or Instagram, uh, just simply Steve Stred. And then my website is uh, uh, com. Well, we know Skype is not the best way to get a hold of you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what was going on there? <laughs> yeah, Skype, Skype messed up there. And David, what about you? Uh, yeah, so um, I'm most active for sure on Twitter when I'm at paperbacks and pugs. So it's take the A and D out of and paperbacks and pugs. And Instagram, uh, if you want to see pictures of my dog Boris posing with vintage horror paperbacks, that is at paperbacks and pugs. Uh, I do have a, a website, but I've not updated it for about a year. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, you had a website. (laughs) So Twitter, Instagram, the best places. And Mike, what about you? Absolutely, the best place to get me. Perfect. And Mike, what about you? Uh, You can find me on Twitter at MikeH5856 or head over to my website at MichaelPatrickHicks.com. And you can find me at Rudy53088 on Twitter. And make sure to give our podcast a follow at Into Staring. Be sure to give us a comment, a review, or wherever you're streaming this podcast. This will help the algorithm spread the abyss around until we consume all. And this is Richard Gerlach saying keep staring. Hey guys, this is Ryan. Nick. And Mike. The host of Your New Opinion. We're a bi-weekly comedy debate podcast. Just a group of idiot friends who are very opinionated. Each episode, we debate some hot-button issue and use every trick we can to get our judge to side with us. You know, hot-button issues like books versus movies, Is the Earth Flat, and Godzilla versus King Kong. We cover topics like pop culture, conspiracy theories, and everyday absurdity. So find us on iTunes or wherever you download podcasts every other Friday. Again, that's your new opinion, only on the Project Entertainment Network. This has been a presentation of the Project Entertainment Network.